All right. I want to welcome uh, everyone here tonight, our visitors, especially our visitors from the Mayus Bible School, faculty and students. Thank you for coming out here tonight. Yeah. commitment that uh, you all are making to, to your faith and to uh, the body of Christ as a whole. We, we appreciate that and we are glad you're with us this evening. So thank you. Um, a couple of things I wanted to let you all know. The bathrooms are right, right here through this door if you need them. Uh, if you need something else to drink or whatever, you can, you're welcome to get up uh, and, and, and move about as you need to. Now, as far as questions go tonight, you're certainly welcome to ask questions. This will be recorded, though, so think, think through your question for it. It's recorded for all of time. Um, but th this is a lecture that is typically, you know, I've seen it done a lot of different ways, but it, it, it's a lot of times three or four hours on this subject, and we're going to be doing it in an hour or so. so um, we're going to be moving through this very, fairly quickly. I do want to give credit to uh, Caleb. Those of you who, who don't know Caleb, Caleb Vibes here, he did... A lot of the research and the bulk of this outline, and uh, I had done something similar a, a long time ago, and I lost it somewhere along the way, and he was kind enough to let me borrow this, so thank you to Caleb, and uh, if there are things in here you don't like, talk to him. <laughs> Those are the things what's changed. If you don't like it, he probably really changed it. I actually, I actually noted what I changed. So, to begin with, the biblical canon, the word canon comes from a Greek word that literally means a measurement or a rule. Uh, in, in church, that's a, a phrase that's used a lot. We have canon law, that is the rules of, of the church. Um, it, it's, it's a generic word, but when you attach it to biblical, it means the books of the Bible that we uh, deem uh, inspired by God and or appropriate for use in worship. Okay? So, We'll begin with the Old Testament. If you look in the middle of the page there, it says it's, it's not clear that, that talking about canonization for the Old Testament is a proper term at all. Because it happened over such a long time and in such a, uh, you might say, organic way that uh, there wasn't a process like we see with the New Testament. Uh, the Hebrew Bible is called, and this, all these Hebrew words I'm going to pronounce incorrectly, uh, <laughs> So don't, don't go out quoting me on it. But the Hebrew Bible is called the Tanakh, and that was uh, written over about a thousand year span. That happened somewhere from the 1400s to 300s BC. Okay? And the, the word Tanakh comes from the three parts of the Bible. The first one being Torah. Now the word Torah is one you may have heard before. That is a Hebrew word for law. Okay? And there is debate, quite frankly, uh, among the uh, various sects of Judaism as to what is Torah. Okay, All agree that Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament, what we call the Pentateuch. Those are the books that, uh, that Moses wrote. They are the books that contain the law. Now, some sects of Judaism would say that Torah includes all of the Scripture. And some still would say that it includes all of the scripture and all of the teachings of the rabbis, midrash, all of that extra teaching that, is, that has been recorded. So sometimes, uh, if, if you were having this conversation with, with, with someone uh, who is Hebrew, who uses this Bible, they might vary in their understanding of what you mean when you say Torah. But everyone accepts that it's the first five books. The law. Now, the second set of, of books that are in the Old Testament uh, are the Nevim, or that's the prophets. And you see listed on your sheet there uh, what books that includes. The third set is, and this one I can't pronounce at all, but you can see it there, Ketuvim, and that's the, the writings. This is um, various stories of how God has dealt with God's people, how people have endured times of, of trouble and trial. Um, this is uh, just, just various writings that, that were considered to be inspired by God that made it in this kind of, I, I hate to call it a catch-all section, but in a, in a way it is. It's not as clearly defined as the law and the prophets. And so these are where the three sections of the Old Testament come from. 
Now, not all of the Old Testament was written by prophets. Most of it was, but not all of it. But the, generally speaking, the point of the Old Testament, the point of writing this all down, was to record for future generations. This was largely, largely uh, an oral tradition. There were very few people who could write. And so recording this stuff would have been a major undertaking. This would have been a big deal, as it should be. Now Moses, as a side note, Moses most likely was able to write. He was, uh, grew up in the house of Pharaoh, would have been well educated. It's, it's widely believed that he probably was capable of writing himself and probably did write the first five books himself. But that wouldn't have been true. It, that, that includes the Old Testament and the New Testament. That wouldn't have widely been true. True. It would have been commonplace for a scribe, that is a person who had received education, uh, to do the writing when someone else dictated to them what, what they wanted to put down. We see that in Paul's writing very, very clearly. And uh, it wouldn't have been an, an uncommon practice at all. So we have the Old Testament. It's written largely by prophets with the intent of preserving the story preserving the message for future generations. And Jesus uh, later acknowledges these three sections of Scripture that we talk about. We see that on page 2. In Luke 24, it says, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the Law of Moses, so that's Torah, the prophets, that's Nevi'im, and the Psalms, or the Psalms are included in, the, in other writings. So Jesus refers to the three sections. And by that point in, in history, this kind of model, these, these three sections and the, the um, 39 books of the Old Testament were, were pretty widely accepted. But as I said at the beginning, there wasn't a strict process by which these came about that we're aware of. Okay, we'll see, we'll see much more of a, a discernible process with the New Testament, and it happens over a much shorter period of time. But for the Old Testament, it seems that we, in, that we and or the, the Jews of Jesus' time inherited uh, this, this set of scriptures that had somehow or another uh, been agreed upon as being holy and inspired Word of God, and that were seen as useful uh, for the teaching of, of, of the people. Okay. Now, to talk specifically about Torah, I, I want to say one, one quick thing here. Um, it says right there at the top of your thing, Torah. It's most likely written by Moses somewhere from 1440 to 1400 B.C. I wanted to take just one second to, to say something about that because some of you may have read uh, in in books or seen on TV, uh, scholarship about these things that says, well, now we, we believe that the Torah was written over 500 years and through multiple authors and all this. And I want to, and I've talked about this a little bit with our Bible study groups and things, but I want to point out the difference between biblical scholarship and historical slash literary scholarship. Okay? Biblical scholarship, and this, this is my opinion, so... Take it for what it's worth. Uh, biblical scholarship, I, I deem as a scholar who typically starts out with the intent of explaining the Bible more fully to, to people of faith. And they begin from a place of faith. Okay? The hope is to understand. Historical and, literal, and literary scholarship generally comes at the Bible and, and the church history from a very different uh, point of view. Historical scholarship says that uh, we're going to judge the validity of the books, of the stories, of the things, by how uh, probable they were. I'll give you a, a simple example. In the New Testament, they would take the gospel lessons, that are the stories in the gospels, and they'd say, well, if a story happens in basically the same way in all four gospels, then we believe that that was likely to have actually happened and likely to be recorded correctly. If it occurred in only one of the Gospels, then it was probably uh, not uh, correct and was probably added later on. 
The point simply being that most of what you're going to see on TV, like on the History Channel, say, or, or some of these, are historical <coughs> or liter literary scholars. And so they come at this stuff from the point of view that it is not probable or likely. Which by its very definition, when you're going to talk about faith, doesn't work very well. If you come at it from the point of view that it's not possible, it's real easy to come out the other side and say, yeah, it's not possible. So I just say that to you as a warning, um, because this, is, this, is, this brought it up in my mind. This is one of those common places where, where you'll see this. It's, it's not likely that Jesus would have died on the cross and been raised, so therefore it didn't happen. So you have all this scholarship around the historical Jesus, okay? Trying to figure out who he was, and, and they'll say, well, he was probably just a, an apocalyptic prophet. But they don't even, it, it's not even possible that he could have been the Son of God and raised from the dead because that doesn't make sense. So I just say that, say that as a warning. That's not to say that you can't get information from those, those sources and that you can't learn from them, but take them, uh, consider the source, I guess, is, is the point of that. So, back to the biblical canon. The Torah, written by Moses from 1440 to 1400, uh, between the exodus, uh, between leaving Egypt, and entry into Canaan. Okay? So this is the wilderness. All right? And it was intended to be uh, the law. This was God's message to God's people, a way for them to recognize sin and to be, therefore avoid it. That was the point of the law, to illuminate sin, to help us understand what it means. It says um, here just under Torah, the way that the people of Israel responded to the reading of the books of the covenant law is an illustration of the fact that the people of, and, and right there, that word is Yahweh, and it's not spelled out, There's the, the um, vowels are missing, because that's a word that in, in the tradition you don't write out. You're actually not even supposed to say it in Jewish tradition. Uh, but the vowels are left out of there, so it's not to spell out the name of God. This is the proper name, for lack of a better term, of God. And so that's how they're often referred to, the people of Yahweh. And they've held to the concept that this literature is divinely inspired. And as early as in Exodus, it says, Moses took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said that the Lord has spoken, what the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. So from the second book, the book of Exodus, we already see an example of Moses reading from sacred writings and the people responding to that. So from very early on, very early on, the people had some sense that, uh, that whatever these writings were, we're not told exactly what it was, but that they were sacred, and that they were of value to people's understanding of God and themselves. Now, the prophets... Uh, is, is are similar. It says, if you look under prophets right there, the important note, that's the one thing I want you to read under that. It said, the words of the prophet were not regarded as authoritative because they were included in the Old Testament. They were included in the Old Testament because they were considered to be authoritative. Does that make sense? They didn't gain their authority by getting included. They got included because they already possessed authority. And so this is kind of the process, if you will, in the Old Testament, and, and to some degree in the New Testament. But this is the process that, that we went through. We don't know how many ancient books there were. We don't even know for the New Testament. We know that, that there are a lot. But we do know the reason behind why uh, some, some made it and some didn't. It's because they were deemed by those who were there, those who were... Uh, close to the situation, those who understood the context, to have authority, to be authoritative and inspired by God. Now, when was the Old Testament canon kind of, for lack of a better term, uh, consolidated and, and, and largely agreed upon? The first date that we kind of know for sure where we see this is in 165 B.C. And uh, 
and it talks about Judas Maccabeus collected all the books that had been lost on account of the war which had come to us, and they are still <coughs> in our possession. And that list of those books is the, the 39 that we see today as the Old Testament canon. Now, I want to talk for just one brief second. There's a lot of notes in here about the Apocrypha. How many of you have ever heard of the Apocrypha? Okay, some of you. I suspect many of you who have heard of it either have had or grew up in uh, Roman Catholic families. The Roman Catholic Church still recognizes uh, the Apocrypha. Um, some Bibles, this is an example, have the Apocrypha. For lack of a better way of putting it, the Apocrypha were the books that didn't quite make the cut for the 39. They were kind of some of the other books that people felt uh, were of value and that were authoritative but didn't make the cut for the 39. Now, most of Christianity uh, does not recognize the Apocrypha as uh, authoritative, that is, as part of the canon. Now, the Roman Catholic Church has historically and still does recognize the Apocrypha and deem it as uh, sacred writings. Uh, but, but the rest of the, of the church uh, does not. And the same is true uh, for most sects of Judaism as well. These are kind of viewed as secondary. Okay? It's not that they're not of value. It's not that they're not uh, good and, and helpful. But they're at a different level. Okay? Now, since most of you haven't heard of the Apocrypha, I suspect most of you don't have any issues with it. So, <laughs> we'll move on from there. Uh, one quick thing to say about the Apocrypha, part of why, uh, for Christianity, why it's not uh, widely included is that those, the books of the Apocrypha are not ever referred to or quoted or referenced in the New Testament. Okay? So they weren't used to support the ideas that people were trying to support, while almost all except three of the books of the Old Testament were used, were quoted at some point, were used as a support for the New Testament writings. So at least in the New Testament uh, writers' minds, there seemed to be a second, a second tier there. Now, why is it important, why is the Old Testament important to Christians? This is a question I don't know if you all have ever asked yourself, but it's been asked of me many, many times. Something along those lines. Why do we even need the Old Testament? Why, I, don't like, I don't like those stories. I don't like the blood. I don't like the death. I don't like... I don't even go as so far as say, I don't like the God that I see in the Old Testament. And I don't think that's an unreasonable statement for anybody who's looked at it deeply and, and struggled with it. But I think, uh, Caleb, if you look right at the bottom of the Old Testament, New Testament is on page 5, right in the middle of the page there in bold, Caleb has a good, a really good quote there. It said, For the early church's use of the Old Testament, they had the authority and example of Christ Himself. And the church ever since has done well when it has followed the precedent set by Him and His apostles and recognize the Old Testament as Christian Scripture. What was indispensable to the Redeemer must always be indispensable to the redeemed. To paraphrase that, it was good enough for Jesus. It's more than good enough for us. And it has tremendous value in understanding the fullness of God and the fullness of our story as people of God. That's really what... In some sense, some, I've, I've, some scholars have described the Old Testament as the story of God's relationship to God's people. And in some ways, much more so than the, than the New Testament. It's a story of how God and God's people have interacted. Now, before we move on to the New Testament, doing pretty good on time, do you all have questions about that? Like I said, I know that was... Way too fast, but do you have questions about the Old Testament? Yes, sir. I have a question about the Apocrypha. From a Catholic perspective, when would those have been included into the canon? That is a good question that I can't answer. Okay. Um, I can tell you, I can tell you from the early, um, from some of the earliest. 
councils. So we're talking even before Nicaea, before some of that. So early 300s, um, there was this debate going on. Um, many of uh, many of the the Roman Catholics. Now you, you got to remember too. You, you have different sects already. We think of it as as one homogenous Roman Catholic Church, but it, even at that point, it wasn't quite that clear. But from the earliest canons, there was this debate about this. And we don't see it, or at least I've not seen it, until several hundred years later where the Catholic Church comes out and the Catholic uh, Bible, which at that point would have been in Latin, the Vulgate, uh, included the Apocrypha. And they've said, yes, this is uh, authoritative scripture. So what happened in between there, I don't know. I can't, I can't honestly answer that question for you. Yes, sir. Doesn't the Episcopal Church use the Apocrypha in their, uh, uh, among their, no, I, I have read from the, uh, uh, from the Apocrypha yeah. myself on a le thicker lesson for a certain Sunday. Yeah, <laughs> there are um, two things here. Um, under the old uh, Episcopal uh, readings, okay, and now the Episcopal Church has, for those of you who aren't uh, part of the church, the Episcopal Church has in the last 10 years or so, uh, switch to the Revised Common Lectionary, which is the same as Presbyterians, Lutheran, everybody else. We uh, uh, we invented the lectionary, and uh, <laughs> we uh, we had our own for umpteen hundred years, and um, that version did include options from the apocrypha, uh, but they weren't the uh, uh, anywhere in those, particularly in the Pistol one, there were options, and one would be listed first, and then the second. Uh, the apocryphal readings would always be a second, second choice, if you will. And so, it, the kind, the idea was that it was intended for occasional use, but not to be the, the go-to one on that Sunday, if you will. But yeah, the, there were, uh, there were certainly options for that in there. Apparently, well, you've exercised those, those options yourself, though. Because I, uh, I know I uh, uh, stood up there and read in front of the Apocrypha, and I, I didn't do it on my own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And That's you fine. can blame me. <laughs> what else? Yes. Um, the, where it says what was indispensable to the Redeemer must always be indispensable to the Redeemed. Yes. And what I understood, the, the first five books, the Torah, were actually a history of the Jewish people. And I wonder if it wasn't indispensable to him because he was a Jewish person. Certainly, yeah, As certainly. As opposed to... Mm -hmm. yeah. any, any time that we read in the Gospels or, or if we think of Jesus teaching in, in, the, in the synagogues and things that we see, when he's talking about Scripture, he's talking about the Old Testament. He's not talking about... It hadn't been written yet. He's not talking about the New Testament. He is talking about Old Testament Scripture. So all the references you see in that are to the Old Testament. Certainly. Anything else? All right. Let's look at the New Testament. Now, as I said, this uh, the New Testament had a little more of a process that, at least that we know, because it was recorded for us in, in, in many ways. Um, the New Testament uh, consists of how many books? Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. I heard it actually from up here. <laughs> 27. And this had to be whittled down from umpteen. Uh, it, you know, s some records would say that there were, uh, you know, as many as, as 90, but others would say that there were hundreds, depending on what level you consider to be uh, a, a book of, of value or whatever. And so there were literally multiples. Of, of this 27 that had to be sorted through in order to figure out what we would use as authoritative scripture. Now, one of the quotes on here, it's in, in italics there, just a few lines down. It says, the early church, with closer ties and greater information than is available to us today, examined the testimony of the ancients. They were able to discern which were authentic and authoritative books by their apostolic origin." Full acceptance of the original recipients followed by continued acknowledgement and use is an essential factor in the development of the canon. What that simply means is that the people who were there, who were close to when these things were written, were the ones who were best able to determine 
Who wrote this? Because the number one question of what got in and what didn't was who wrote it? Can you prove it? Because a very common practice at that time would be for me to sit down and say, well, you know, I've got this brilliant revelation from God. I'm going to write this out and it's going to be amazing. And, uh, but since people haven't heard of me, I think I'll sign this, Paul. So that's going to carry a little more weight. All right? I'll try that. Yeah. A very, very common practice. Peter, Paul. There are countless manuscripts that are, that are attributed uh, to the apostles. Because that was kind of the standard, if you will. The apostles. They had to have uh, that, that standing in order to uh, have the authority to write scripture, to, uh, to share the truth with the rest of the church. So, that's an important statement. That's a really important statement to say that the people who were there were the ones who were m most well equipped to weed out the imposters. And so to some degree, the scripture that survived, that moved forward in the church, that in and of itself is the most important testimony to what was authentic and authoritative and what wasn't. The fact that we can go back now and find hundreds of different versions and things, we don't have the information that they had. We don't have the ability that they had to weed out what was authentic and what wasn't. And so that is the kind of first and most important rule in what makes it in and what doesn't. Now, <coughs> the church's concept of canon, that is, why do we even need to have a set of books that we consider authoritative? And why do we need to determine what those are and aren't? really comes from their reverence of Old Testament Scripture. They had inherited this Old Testament Scripture and they understood instinctively that having this collection of authoritative books was important. It was important for the teaching of the people in the church and the people in the future. So that was the beginning impetus of, of collecting, of maintaining, of keeping these authoritative works. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is that early on, uh, and, and this changes several hundred years later, but we don't know for sure what, what uh, there was and wasn't, but it seems almost certain that there weren't Bibles as we think of them running around. In other words, it wasn't like Paul could show up at town and whip out his authoritative book of these, these are the scriptures. No. There were letters floating around, many of whom were from Paul, from other apostles. Uh, there were the Gospels. But they weren't collected in a single book as we tend to think of them. They were written on, uh, on a papyrus, perhaps a scroll, and they would have traveled often as individual letters around to the different uh, communities. Uh, they would have been copied, transcribed, sent out, so it wasn't as um, kind of neat as we tend to think of Scripture. Even the Old Testament Scripture wasn't that way, and still uh, to this day in Jewish uh, synagogues, at least in the worship, is not that way. They come out in individual scrolls. And so there's not, there's not a simple book that everybody's got and that everybody's reading, or that everybody's at least reading the same thing. There's these different letters going around. You might say, hey, we, we, we got a new letter from Paul that he wrote to so-and-so, but we're going to share this with you as a, as a means of teaching and instructing. And paper and or writing was very difficult and expensive to come by. And so it would have been regarded, one, as, as a real treasure, but also it would have been... Um, Closely guarded. This isn't something that people could just take home with them or, uh, you know, that, that would be passed out freely. This would have been read in a gathering, typically with, uh, with a communion. That was kind of the, the framework of, of early worship. Often singing, then they would read aloud the scriptures and talk about them, and communion. That, that was worship. So, the historic process of the New Testament canon. Now, I added this. I said that there are two major questions. Two major questions 
that uh, determined whether something would be included or not. The first one, as we said, was authorship. That was uh, by far the most important question. But the second question was, and, and this was a hard one to put words to, different people worded in different ways, uh, but we see this debate uh, early in the church and throughout those, is it the inspired uh, word of God and does it bear forth the faith? Okay. That was a, a phrase that we see very commonly uh, by, the, by the second century. Does it bear forth the faith? I'll give you a, an example. Many of you have heard of, or some of you have asked me about, the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is a collection of, I think, 115 sayings of Jesus. Um, and I, I don't know the, the answer to its authorship, but I do know that one of the objections uh, early on was that it, in many respects, uh, presented a different, uh, a different version or different teaching of Jesus that didn't match with the Gospels and with what the apostles who were there at the time knew of Jesus. So that question, that second question, even if we can identify and agree on the authorship of it, does it bear forth the faith? In other words, Peter didn't have the authority to just write some crazy off the wall something and get it in the Bible. Peter, Paul, nobody had that authority. It still had to meet a stringent standard of, can, can we all sort of agree on this? Or does this sound crazy? Does that make sense? So those are the two questions. Who wrote it? Does it bear forth the faith? Yes, that's good. I was thinking of uh, Galatians even. Paul says, how quickly you're turning to a different gospel. And so what that tells you is that during that time, there were teachings circulating that were not did not end up being agreed upon that this is the true gospel. Yeah. So it wasn't just in spoken word, but in written word as well. Yeah. So the apostles and... And that, that's part of the reason some of the books aren't included. Yeah, yeah. Some of the some of the manuscripts that we have of of, of these books that didn't make it are from very early in, in, in the church history, from you know one one twenty five to you know to two hundred, which are pretty early for the manuscripts we have. <laughs> but they didn't make it into the twenty seven books uh, for one of those those two reasons. So certainly there were teachings circulating around that uh, Paul deemed inappropriate. Um, yeah. So, let's talk real quickly. There, uh, there's several things here about the various periods of the kind of progression of the New Testament canon, if you will. It says period one was the, the first century. most important thing there is the top line. It says Paul calls for public reading of apostolic communications. And we see that in 1 Thessalonians. That's an important moment. Paul is saying, look, when, when he's, he's, of course, referring to himself there, but he's also saying, when the apostles send you a letter, you need to read it. You need to share it. This is authoritative. So it's kind of one of the first moments where we're seeing